Ladies and gentlemen, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you this evening that have joined us, uh, especially, of course, to our speaker, Dr. Mario Gren. I will say a few words about him shortly. Let me at first introduce you to our APIC, the Archive Library for Post-Neo-Kantianism and Contemporary Critical Idealism, which is situated in Wuppertal. Uh, the APIC was found in um, 2021 by Alexander Schnell, Michael Boch, and myself. And uh, within the APIC, there are several uh, fields of research. One of them is called AI, Digitality, and Transcendental Philosophy. And uh, I am the leader of this research uh, issue or this research group, so to say. And Within this research group, we conduct several online lecture series, one of them taking place this semester. And today's talk is the second talk of the semester on digitality and transcendental philosophy. That's all I'd like to say about the APIC for now. And now I want to introduce to you our speaker of this evening, Dr. Mario Krenn. He is the research group leader of the Artificial Scientist Lab at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light in Erlangen. He studies within his work the potential of artificial intelligence inspired and augmented science and how we can use algorithms in a more creative way, as he himself puts it. He is uh, in this context especially interested in inspiring novel ideas for quantum technologies and the use of machine learning to predict and suggest personalized future research questions. Mario Krenn holds a PhD in physics at the University of Vienna and he, there he worked in the group of Anton Zeilinger, you for sure know the name. Uh, Martin Krenn's uh, uh, promo uh, uh, dissertation was on uh, quantum experiments with spatial modes of photons and large real and Hilbert spaces. His professional experience uh, contains his, uh, con his uh, nowadays position at the Max Planck Institute in Erlangen. Earlier in uh, the past years, he also was a FVF Erwin Schrödinger postdoctoral fellow. He was part of the University of Toronto, Canada and the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence also in Toronto in Canada as well as uh, a part of the Institute for Advanced Research in Artificial Intelligence in Vienna, Austria, where he was also a postdoctoral fellow in the group of Anton Zeilinger. Regarding his publications, I'd like to mention just a few newer ones on the issue of AI and digitality. Uh, there is a new paper preprint on how to use virtual reality for understanding AI generated ideas and designs in physics. Also, he shortly uh, in, uh, in the last months, he published a paper on the deep meaning and deep, I'm, I'm sorry, the deep dreaming on uh, quantum graphs uh, or a paper on AI driven designs of uh, 100 new quantum experiments. Last year, he published a paper on um, in, in Nature and Machine Intelligence about the prediction of future research directions in artificial intelligence, as well as a paper on AI-driven discovery for the super-resolution uh, microscopy. So you'll see uh, Mario Kren works in a very broad sense on the fields of AI, machine learning, and quantum technology. And uh, dear Mario, we very much look forward to your talk, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. OK, so uh, thanks a lot. Um, so my name is Mario Krenn, and uh, as Robert said, I'm leading the Artificial Scientist Lab in Erlangen at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light. Um, and the goal of my group is to to see how we can use artificial intelligence at a more conceptual level in physics or in science in general. And we do this, uh, two of our main directions are first we try to, to do this um, by using AI for designing new um, hardware, new physics experiments, new quantum technologies with artificial intelligence. And when the programs found some of those solutions, um, that we humans would not be able to come up with, we then 
um, get new ideas, how we can use the components that we are working with um, uh, at the daily basis, how we can use them in a new way. And the second part of my research is to use hundreds of thousands or millions of scientific uh, papers and try to see um, whether we can extract new ideas uh, with this big picture view on the scientific literature. Um, for instance, um, can we predict what scientists will work on in the future? Can we predict what will be impactful in the future that has actually never been done before? Um, and can we predict what is interesting in the future? I will show briefly something about the first two questions. I will not show something about the question of interest because that is very much a topic of um, current research. Okay, so let me set the stage. Imagine we have an oracle and this oracle can perfectly predict the um, outcome of every particle physics experiment or the, um, the uh, outcome of every chemical reaction or the structure of every folded protein. Such an oracle obviously would be extremely useful for technology and would be extremely useful for us in science. But somehow as scientists, we would probably not be entirely satisfied because we want more. We not only want to know how uh, to know um, the outcomes, but we want to know actually how the machine or how this oracle was able to get to this outcome. We want to know what this machine understood in order to come up with this um, with these predictions. And so this is definitely, uh, for me, this is definitely not down the uh, um, uh, philosophical question, but that is, uh, I think, one of the main questions that we need to answer when we to when we apply artificial intelligence in science. And a couple of years ago, um, we took this question then actually uh, very serious. And we wanted to see how one can get actually scientific understanding with artificial intelligence. And our approach uh, was in two directions. So first, okay, first we wanted to actually read scientific papers and see um, scientific papers that use the AI to get some new uh, things in science. But then when you read papers, usually what happens is that the way how the ideas were generated are not described there, mainly only the outcomes are described in papers. So what we did is we sent emails to about 100 computational physicists, chemists, and biologists, and asked them about their personal anecdotes how they got um, ideas and inspirations um, and new insights using advanced computational techniques or artificial intelligence. And we actually got uh, more than 50 such anecdotes. Some of them were absolutely amazing. Um, one chemist, for instance, for instance, wrote that a couple of years ago, his machine found something so surprising he couldn't believe that this is possible. He had to stop working for the day and had to go to the beach to calm down because he was uh, so excited about those um, uh, those new results. So we collected a number of uh, different personal anecdotes. And uh, so we got a broad overview of how scientists actually can get this, can get more than, um, than just prediction from AI at the moment. And at the second, our second approach was to look into the philosophy of science and actually think about what does it even mean when we talk about scientific understanding. So that was one of the very big um, problems in the beginning when we were thinking about this project because we had no idea how to start. And then uh, very coincidentally, I found this very, this amazing book by Henk de Recht, um, which is called Understanding scientific understanding. And um, Derek gives a very pragmatic way to think about this question. So he says that 
scientists can understand a phenomenon if they can recognize qualitatively characteristic consequences. Now that's important without performing exact calculations. So it seems that direct um, connects scientific understanding with the skill to use concepts fruitfully, new concepts fruitfully, without exact calculations. And um, there's a lot, a lot of work um, then looked at direct idea, um, some of them critical, a lot of them um, uh, expanding his work. And actually, this book got the uh, uh, Lakatoshi Award for the best contribution in uh, philosophy of science in, I think, 2019. Um, yeah, so I can only highly recommend uh, this book. It's very, very good uh, to read. With a lot of examples from the history. So we found this approach uh, very useful because when you think about it in a pragmatic way and not think about the question what scientific understanding is inside of the brain, but kind of observe it from outside, then it doesn't matter what you are observing. So at that point, it doesn't matter whether you're observing a human, a animal, aliens, or artificial intelligence. And that was the very powerful um, idea uh, of this type of, um, of description of scientific understanding. I talked since with Hank Direct, and he was at the time of writing not really aware that one could expand it to those other uh, fields. And he is not sure whether this is a good idea or whether this is the best way to think about scientific understanding in this much broader uh, context. So it's, it's clear that um, that there is still a lot of a lot of uh, room for for work on this topic. So. Now, with these two different approaches, with the insights from philosophy of science and with the insights from actually working scientists from, uh, from uh, physics, chemistry, and biology, we were then able to kind of classify the ability to get, um, to get new understanding with artificial intelligence into three different classes. The first class is uh, something that we call computational microscope, where the human can use uh, some advanced computational algorithm or AI to perform virtual some experiments that are completely impossible to perform um, in real world. And there are several examples uh, for that, for instance, to see uh, some biological processes uh, in much more detail than we can at the moment see in the laboratory. There were a lot of very interesting examples provided by biochemists here, for instance, one of maybe one of the most impressive one were those uh, very advanced stimulations of the COVID virus, because we wrote this paper basically during COVID time. So people were very excited about, uh, about applying the techniques there. And um, uh, those biochemists were able to see some of the properties of the COVID virus that was at least very, very hard to see in experiments. Uh, and they had to use a lot of um, machine learning also to, to get there. Now, when you see things that you were not able to see before, that's very often just the, the visualization very often provides you with new uh, ideas um, automatically. And now maybe um, because uh, Robert has mentioned this virtual reality work that we did, one very big question in this first class is how can we how can we actually represent the data in a way that we human can understand it in a better way? And usually data is only um, represented, let's say as a, as a, as numbers or maybe as a 2D plot, very rarely as 3D plot. But we as humans have much more perception. We can see in a 3D world, we can hear, we can smell, we can feel, touch, and so on. So the question is, can we actually use those other senses to represent data such that we humans um, can perceive this data in a much more advanced way? 
And we tested this in a 3D environment. We used virtual reality to project the outputs of some of our algorithms, not on 2D papers and try to understand it there, but actually in a 3D environment, which uh, a master student who just finished, um, uh, Philip Schmidt, has uh, performed. And it was really impressive. When you are in this 3D world, you can see structures and when you can manipulate uh, the outputs, you can see things that you can perform things that would be completely impossible on paper. And in this manuscript that um, Robert mentioned, we have actually seen a few, a few new structures that we were not aware of um, before we used this 3D world. The other um, application of this different representation of data is sound. And this is actually very surprising, but in astronomy, there are a lot of projects where people try to sonific, uh, to perform sonification of data, such that it's not represented uh, in a, for the visual sense, but um, that you can hear the data. And there are a lot of interesting examples. For instance, when you look at uh, data that is um, that is extracted from um, gravitational wave detectors, when you look at the data, you can completely see nothing, absolutely nothing. But when you then uh, sonify the data and hear it, you can hear whether there is a gravitational wave or whether there is no gravitational wave. And there are many, many exper experiments that try to sonify the data. And now imagine you would have the ability to project your data in a 3D environment with sound and potentially um, in a time-dependent 3D environment with sound. So basically you're in a 3D movie with sound and everything that you hear or perceive is uh, data. There are also experiments on the haptic response. Um, so where you can get an intuitive feeling, for instance, for the strength of um, of bonds or uh, in, in chemistry or other things. So there's a lot of very interesting um, topic there. And all of that then comes together, or all of that wants to solve the question of how to make a human, the question of understanding, how to make it for a human easier to understand something. So that would be uh, in this first class. The second class is source AI as a source or even resource of inspiration where we can get new ideas from those uh, algorithms. And a lot of a lot of the uh, work that I do in my group is basically trying to push this second class as far as uh, we can. And many of the examples that we got were also very much into this direction. And the last class, the third class, is the agent of understanding, where in some way the AI understands something autonomously and then is able to explain it to the human. Now, we did not get a single example for this class three. And also until now, I think there is not a single example out there for class three, where we would say, okay, the artificial intelligence algorithm has understood something that we didn't know before and then is able to explain it to us. But who knows um, now with the advance of, of those um, large language models, who knows, maybe GPT-5 can actually find out new things and explain them to us. But because we don't have any examples for class three, I will mainly talk about the examples in class two, and then in the end, only very briefly mention um, this agent of understanding. Okay, so the ideas in class two that uh, we can use uh, uh, artificial intelligence algorithm that acts as uh, artificial muse that gives us new inspiration for new concepts um, or ideas. And then the human has to lift those new insights to real scientific understanding. And maybe I mention uh, one story from my, from my own research. So 
I uh, worked in the group of Anton Zeilinger. And there we wanted to study uh, new forms of quantum entanglement. So uh, those properties that um, the Zeilinger got the Nobel Prize uh, for uh, two years ago. Um, at the uh, time uh, when I was uh, there, we wanted to investigate a very specific uh, quantum state that has that has never been studied before. And the theorists uh, said and, and predicted that it might have some very interesting um, properties. And usually what happens when we, uh, when we want to um, investigate a certain system in the laboratory is that we first need to know what experimental setup we need to build. And usually how that works is that we go to uh, a blackboard or to a piece of paper and we um, doodle around and usually we find an experimental setup rather quickly. But at this point, it was different. For a few um, days, several of us, that was maybe three experimentalists, uh, two uh, theoretists, we were not able to find any experimental setup that could produce the state that we wanted to investigate then. So obviously without creating the state, we cannot invest, investigate those properties. So then a few days passed by, a few weeks passed by, and we still didn't have the setup. And then after a few months, maybe three or four months, um, we nearly gave up. We uh, nearly thought, okay, it's uh, we cannot uh, build this state. We cannot investigate this state. And at that point, I thought maybe it's just our approach is uh, very wrong. And maybe just this human-based intuitive approach to design those experiments is wrong. And I thought about maybe we can build a experiment, um, maybe we can build a program that can automatically design such um, experimental setups. For instance, the program could have access to uh, all optical elements that we have in the laboratory and then cleverly arrange them at the virtual, uh, at the virtual uh, laboratory and uh, simulate its, um, its properties. And um, I then wrote this program, it took a few hours to write this program and I started it in the evening and when I came back in the morning, I actually saw a solution.txt file at my computer. And I was extremely excited, uh, and we looked into this uh, in the solution.txt file, and for um, and then after a few hours, uh, we actually confirmed that that is exactly the solution that we were searching for. That we humans were not able to find, but the computer within I don't know five or ten hours was able to find. And then this solution was actually perfectly feasible to build in the lab. And it was then um, built in the lab by two of my uh, colleagues, or a few of my colleagues, mainly Manuel Erhard and um, Mihul Malik. And they were able to build this experiment in the laboratory, produce the state for the first time, and actually um, look at some of those properties to, that we were so interested in um, before. Now. Building this experiment took another three or four years. So that was definitely not the easy thing um, because the solution, while it was 100% feasible, was kind of weird and unhuman. And uh, we needed to learn some of those tricks, how to actually use them in the lab precisely. But nevertheless, it was uh, perfectly feasible to be built. So obviously, we were very happy and we tried to apply um, this algorithm also for other questions. Um, but for me, the most interesting thing was when I applied this uh, algorithm to explore the space of complex entangled system in a much more broad way. So in the lab, we had five or six computers that were not used. So I copied my algorithm to all of those uh, computers and just let it explore this huge space um, of experimental setups. Um, and um, I give the algorithm a very certain constraint, such 
um, that it can only produce low number of entanglement because the larger the entanglement is that you uh, that the algorithm algorithm can compute with, the slower it gets to compute the experimental setup. So there's uh, it becomes much much more expensive to compute large entangled systems. So I constrained basically the resources that I gave um, to the computer. So it can only so I knew it can only produce entanglement within a certain range. And then when I came back here a few uh, weeks later and I looked at the result, I saw that one of those solutions was significantly larger than this limit that I thought needs to be there. So the first thing was I thought uh, there's a bug in the code and uh, all of the results are nonsense. But then I looked into the solution and um, after a few days, after a few days, I understood that this solution, so first the code was correct, I can verify it by hand. And what is under what is underlying to this solution was the idea that goes back to the early 1990s, the very certain quantum interference effect that has that was a little bit dubious and has never been used afterwards uh, a lot. But this idea, um, my computer algorithm completely implicitly, without knowing about it, completely implicitly was able to use to generate those complex entangled states that overcome my limitation. And as soon as we understood this, we immediately were able to generalize this idea to many other systems. And um, uh, and yeah, and we were able to generalize it to many other systems. And we were, we wrote then a, a complete theory paper, basically without mentioning anything about AI, just about these new ideas of how to use this type of quantum interference for the first time for a generation of uh, entanglement. And if you think about this paper, so this paper got then accepted in DRL, which is one of the, um, uh, one very good uh, physics journal. And if you think about this paper, none of the authors of this paper came up with the idea. The authors at this paper we just analyzed what the computer has shown to us. We were just analyzing its result. We didn't come up with the idea. We probably wouldn't have come up with this idea because for more than 20 years, people didn't see this idea, which was kind of lying around in the, in the neighborhood. So that was a very surprising, um, a very surprising event for, for me and also for, for the others. And, um, at that time, I got absolutely hooked and I knew, okay, AI can be used for so much more than what it is used at the moment. So in general, computers can be used at a such such a more creative way than uh, it is used um, uh, at the moment. Okay, so uh, this was a few years ago. Maybe I explain now uh, one experiment that we are uh, one uh, direction that we are uh, doing right now. So a more modern version of this. So think about the space of all physics experiments. So this is an enormously crazily large space. Think about you have a laser and then a beam splitter and another beam splitter, how you can put up all of those, um, all of those experiments is just a, enormous, a crazy large space. For instance, when you have just three lasers, three beam splitters, three detectors, you can already build uh, 1,000 different combinations, different experiments. When you have five lasers, five beam splitters, five detectors, you can already build up more than 80,000 experiments. And the space just grows. When you add more uh, different elements, the space just grows exponentially. And in this space, we have all of the um, exceptionally and interesting experiments. Most of this space is completely useless, and doesn't make any sense. Uh, but somehow, somewhere out there in this enormously large space, there are those extremely exceptional and useful experimental setups. For instance, um, 
some super resolution microscopy techniques or some uh, gravitational wave detectors or some um, ionic quantum computer uh, designs and so on. And the human has uh, the task now to investigate this space. And um, we, uh, and we as a humanity have found some of those very exceptional experimental setups. For instance, um, uh, super resolution microscopy, or uh, some very advanced telescopy techniques. But the question is, is this everything that is out there? And just thinking about the question in this way, that there's this crazy normal experimental space, the answer is probably no. And the question is, how can a computer investigate, or how can how can we investigate uh, this space? And the answer might be uh, computers and uh, intelligent algorithms. And that is exactly how I see the use of AI for experimental design at the moment. And one of the examples is uh, for gravitational wave detectors. So recently we had a collaboration uh, with the LIGO collaboration. LIGO stands for Laser Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory. And it is a collaboration of, um, I think, a few hundred or even thousand uh, people who try to detect gravitational waves. The gravitational waves are fluctuation in space time. And those fluctuations in space time occur when um, occur in some of the most extreme events in the universe. For instance, when two black holes uh, collide or when a, a large star explodes uh, into a supernova, those events produce gravitational waves. And this is a prediction, or this was a prediction from Einstein's general relativity in, I think it was predicted in 2000, uh, in, in 1916, that space time should have those uh, ripples. And it was thought to be completely impossible to observe them because the length scales, um, so what gravitational waves are doing is they very, very slightly change distances between two objects. But the, the um, ratio of distance that they change is enormously small. So to give a number, uh, it changes. The relative distance change of a gravitational wave is roughly when you have one meter, it would change it to one meter plus 10 to the minus 22. This is so small, I don't even know the name for uh, this further, um, for this number. Um, and now the question is, can we detect those gravitational waves? Because if yes, we can study in a completely different way black holes. We can study in a completely uh, different ways exploding stars and many other events in the universe. And this LIGO collaboration has started, I think, in the 70s or 80s. And they were determined to build devices that can detect um, those gravitational waves. And actually in 2015, they have detected for the first time a gravitational wave from two colliding black holes. And until today, um, humanity has uh, observed uh, 90 or 95 um, gravitational waves. And with that data, we understand much more about the distribution of, of black holes in the universe and uh, many other astrophysical um, properties. Uh, so those detectors, uh, they usually look like um, you have one laser, you split this laser beam, and then you have a very, very, very long arm where the laser beams are propagating. And in this case, uh, for the LIGO detectors, the arms are four kilometers. Uh, so four kilometer long arms. Now, this detector was built twice at two different locations in the United States, in the uh, Northwest and in the Southeast, because in that way they can determine whether a signal that they detect uh, comes from a local noise source. For instance, when a, a motorcycle passes by a, a street that is a few hundred meters away, or whether it's really coming from, from outside. 
Now, those detectors have been designed by extremely clever uh, human researchers. But now our question was, so this is the design of the detector. Okay, I will not go into it. Only here's the laser and here the arms and here's some additional fancy optics. Here's some sensitivity curve that says how sensitive is the detector. Now, the question is, can we, um, can we design new detectors that are much more efficient than those uh, detectors? And by that, observe many, many more of those uh, black holes, or maybe for the first time, supernova explosions, or some other very weird astrophysical phenomena. And in order to do this, we, we wrote a program that already has built in a a naturally extremely large search space. And then in this search space, we can apply um, a technique that is very similar to the technique that is used to train neural networks. But now we are not training neural networks. Now we are optimizing some super over complete experimental uh, setups. So that is just on the technical part, but Actually, what we find is, in some cases, we find detectors that are that would allow to increase the count rate by a factor of 50. Uh, for instance, for supernova explosions, we did not see any supernova explosions yet. Let's say the, the yearly probability is, or uh, the yearly expected supernova uh, that we see is 10 to the minus 1. Now, if one would build our detector, we would see five of those events every year. So every six uh, days, we would see one. And many of those other, um, many of those other um, interesting astrophysical phenomena, we also found detectors that are much more sensitive than those that humans design. So that is great. But now the question is, what did the machine find? And this project is still roughly two and a half years. In the first, let's say, one year, roughly, we got uh, the AI to work in this space and got it to find the results. And basically, in the last nine months, we were just analyzing what does the physics mean of those detectors. And we found, and that was mainly done by my colleagues from uh, LIGO, from, from Caltech, uh, and we found very weird new constructions. For instance, usually um, the laser light goes then directly to the detector and we observe the laser light after this four kilometer arms. But here, for some reason, the AI decided to build a ring cavity so that the light can circulate here. And part of the light sometimes goes back into the arms. Uh, we understand that it does that. We can compute that this is better than what is done before, but we still don't really understand why it is doing that. It kind of doesn't make sense yet, at least to me, not yet completely. Um, but this gives us now a huge amount of um, of new techniques where we know they are better than what humans decide. And we know somewhere in this picture there's the answer of some new physics ideas um, that we can then just stare at for a few months and maybe extract. Okay, so this would be one way to um, to generate um, to generate new inspirations. And if you look at if you look no, not at the gravitational wave example, but at this example where my program found this much higher entanglement, uh, this. This we saw basically as an outlier. We saw we had some expectation, and there was this outlier that we could look at. So in a way, we had a program that can generate and uh, plot the anomaly or this outlier in a way that we can uh, observe it, so that we can see it. A different way to get new inspiration is from a large amount of scientific literature. And I will briefly give uh, one example. Uh, um, so the, uh, a few years ago, uh, researchers used, um, or chemists used, 3 million of scientific articles. And 
use the algorithm that is called word to vector coding. Um, and this algorithm basically takes text and translates it into a high dimensional continuous vector space. But usually this is used such that neural networks can then work in this high dimensional continuous vector space. But uh, this translation from text to this uh, vector space has some very specific properties, namely that words that are semantically similar, they are clustered together. And what the researchers have done is they looked at, after encoding those 3 million papers, they looked at the word thermoelectricity, uh, for instance. And they were interested in which materials are close to thermoelectricity. And then they found, okay, the closest one to thermoelectricity, this one, uh, this one is known to be thermoelectric and is actually used in some uh, devices. The second closest one is also known. The third one is also known. Until the 325th one, all are known and all are actually used in some used in some experiments or are already in some devices. Until um, number 326, which is a material that has never been mentioned to be thermoelectric, right? in any way connected to thermoelectricity. And now, just from looking at those 3 million papers, the algorithm, in a way, completely automatically was able to deduce that very likely this material is also thermoelectric. Now, researchers can uh, use this new insight and try to understand in which cases is it thermoelectric and can I build a device for it? Can I use it in an experiment in an interesting way? A very different way to use large amount of scientific literature is to use semantic um, networks that can um, that uh, that capture some of the evolution of how scientists investigated uh, different research directions. And in this article, for instance, we we have used 750,000 articles um, in quantum mechanics, and each of the vertex in this, um, in this graph is a concept, a quantum mechanical concept, and each of the edge happens when two concepts are um, when two concepts are mentioned together in the scientific literature. Now, when we do this for all of those 750,000 articles from the last 50 years, say, then we get a knowledge graph that kind of uh, expands over the years. So we basically can observe how uh, scientists investigated the field of quantum mechanics. But now, because we have the evolution from the past, we can actually ask questions into the future because we can now train the neural network in all of the past, um, in all of the past dynamics, let's say until the year 2017. And then, at, uh, then when the neural network has trained to predict what scientists will work on and what they will not work on, um, we can actually apply to the year 2022 or 2023 or 2024 and predict actually into the future and see what scientists will work on. And when when we applied for uh, from 2020 uh, from 2017 to 2022, we actually see extremely large, uh, extremely good prediction quality. So in a way, um, science is quite well uh, predictable. Um, uh, a different way to get new inspiration is by having the neural network, uh, by having a neural network and having it produce interpretable results. And the interpre interpretable result would be, for instance, mathematical formulas. And there were several cool results where researchers gave a neural network the task to predict some astrophysical. Um, properties, and then they were able to extract the laws that the machine has learned. Uh, for instance, here for, um, I think this was simple planetary movements, and also for, for certain dark matter uh, distributions. And here for dark matter, the researchers actually got 
some formula that describes the data better than uh, than what was known before. Just this formula was, while it is simple, it is still kind of difficult uh, to interpret. So there are constants that are very difficult to interpret yet. But this is definitely some somewhere where uh, where the field is going. That is uh, called symbolic regression. I could show this as a video if it runs. So kind of it works like this. The algorithm tries to build up new and advanced um, computational graphs or, or equation graphs that fit the equation in a very nice way without using uh, many parameters. Okay. A different way to get new inspiration is by actually looking inside of the neural network. And this is the last example that I show. Uh, there was one work where scientists have given the algorithm again the uh, simple astrophysical task. They gave it the task to predict the position of Sun and Mars as they are seen from Earth. And the algorithm, so the neural network, was able to learn this very well and um, and predict very well those positions. And after this task, the scientists looked inside of the neural network and they looked what and how did the machine answer this question. And they see that instead of using the geocentric coordinate, the, the angles of those planets as they are seen from Earth, the neural network made a coordinate transformation such that uh, such that the coordinates inside were represented as angles as they seem as they are seen from the sun, because internally apparently for the neural network it was easier to work with those variables. So in a completely implicit way, the machine has performed the shift from the geocentric to the heliocentric worldview. That is very interesting. Second interesting thing is that the scientists were actually able to find out that the machine was able to do that. Um, so this is super exciting. Unfortunately, we already know for 350 years that the heliocentric worldview is quite superior. Uh, so the question now is how to apply it to um, to new topics, and that is what or to to new physics, and that is what many uh, research, researchers are trying. Different way is to try to observe the behavior of machines while they are exploring some spaces. I will not go into this now. Maybe a last uh, point in, if I have still two minutes. Um, okay. Uh, is the question, how can we get now understanding from an algorithm that understood something itself? So what? how can we test whether the algorithm has understood something? So we were mainly interested in how can we get new understanding from this algorithm. So how can this algorithm explain something to us? And we were mainly motivated, well, first we were motivated to shift the question about whether the algorithm understood something to what we can learn from the algorithm because we are humans and we are egoistic and we want to understand something. And second also, those definitions that Hank Derek um, created that we base a lot of our uh, study on are not really applicable to machines because or to algorithms because they directly have explicitly written that um, uh, that the entity should should not uh, should uh, perform uh, should get those consequences without performing exact computations. Now, how can we decide whether machine um, whether machine performs exact computations? So we translated this into a different task. Uh, we said, okay, maybe it makes more sense to think about it. Um, to say a machine has probably got something that one might call understanding if it can explain it to us, and then the human got new understanding. So basically, and that is also easy uh, to test. We can just test it in a, something that's motivated by a Turing test. We can just uh, test whether the machine, whether the student learned uh, something new, got new understanding, 
and we can then uh, test this basically from outside. More detailed test is described in our uh, in our uh, article. Now let me come uh, to an end. I think we are uh, we are now approaching an era where machines and algorithms can be applied in a much different way than we apply them so far. They can give us new ideas. They can give us new inspirations, insights, really new ones. And I've seen this in my own research, and we have this large collection already, how machines can inspire. The question is, how can we push this further? How can we push further also the ability to produce exceptional creative solutions? Um, and a different thing that is very different from uh, machines and humans, if you think about building a real artificial scientist, is that not only humans are creative and machines, well, the question is what is creative, but humans are curious. What about machines? And there's a lot of work in artificial curiosity and artificial um, uh, int intrinsic reward systems, which very much goes into this direction. The la uh, last or uh, other question is, what about now understanding? We didn't see a single example of how a machine would be qualified or we would call a machine to uh, understood something yet. How can we um, actually make this? How can we test it in the in a good way? So there are, I think, there are a lot of interesting questions that are open. Okay, thank you.